Thank you. Thank you. This is Immerse, the podcast and book. We are delighted to have you join us. Immerse is produced by Charlie Morrow, Sean McCann, and Bart Plantinga for Morrow Sounds, Vermont, and Helsinki, and Recital Edition, Los Angeles. Immerse. 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 Immerse.
Um, I thought a lot about holistic design. I think when you and I first spoke about this topic, I talked about the aspiration to do holistic design. And that's a term that I've always liked in any work that I've done to, to take, go at it holistically. And that's another term that requires a definition. Um, but I think holistic design means that you <laughs> do the whole package for one and you consider as much as you can possibly consider in the design of a human experience. And so whether you're talking about holistic design or immersive design, it goes back to the root that it's for a person, it's for people. It's centered on human beings and our environment um, as opposed to anything else. And it sometimes boggles my mind to think what else would design before if not for us. But it does seem that there is an approach to design which was just about trying to get techni technical mastery over the mediums uh, the, uh, that we were working in. And so people lost track of why it was being done, I suppose. And therefore you had technology driven designs or industry living, li uh, driven designs that weren't human centric. And so this idea of human centric design emerged over the past hundred years, I guess, described as such. And it makes a lot of sense to me. And anyone that I've ever worked with has always come from that point of view. And so if you're going to be designing an experience for somebody, it's a pretty uh, audacious thought to begin with. <laughs> but uh, that is, is it's, it's, it can be a delightful thought and one that's done with altruism and generosity and the goal to make a great experience for everyone involved. This idea of holistic design seems to come next or come as part of that because a person is part of many different concentric circles of um, environment, I suppose. And you want to consider as much of those as you can in creating that experience. And so I, th I th my recent thought on this is that you can always be more holistic. <laughs> There's always more that you can, you can be more holistic than you were yesterday. <laughs> your, your design can be more holistic than the last one. And what does that mean? It means that it reaches as far as it possibly can to create an envelope around the experience you're creating for a person or people. And so I, I was thinking about some of the reading I did. All the people I've worked with over the years, be it Alan Lomax or Ed Schlossberg, both have been really interested in Gregory Bateson and so therefore I looked into some Gregory Bateson uh, a, a book called Steps to an Ecology of Mind and in that book he talks about that you can't really ever understand a thing but you can only understand a thing in context and uh, that every context has a wider context and so that's a really interesting framework for thinking about holistic design because you're going to want to touch as many of the ever widening circles of context around a person or a group of people um, to affect the experience you want to get to create the experience you want to get and that's what i mean by you can always be more holistic you can always go wider you know i guess it's like the famous powers of 10 you know you could try to touch on a, on a an experience from many different uh, levels of scale. And so I think that this idea of immersivity that people are really excited about talking about now grows, grows out of that experience design practice and is essentially the next uh, chapter of people realizing how complete or how holistic a design could be. And so, and yet does it need to mean that you're completely 100% enveloped in a story that removes you from your current reality. I don't think so. In fact, I think it's elusive, the thought of immersive, immersivity and is just an, another way of thinking about environmental experience design, which is the, what I practice. So when in talking about 
my practice is called experience design in the built environment. And so it's, a, and particularly talks a lot about digital experience and digital interventions in the built environment. Although that's a, a limited way to uh, think about it actually, that is the new thing that people are interested in and sort of opens the door. But really it's the, cre it, it's really about creating areas of heightened experience in the built environment, whether you're using graphics or sound or digital media or traditional media or data from the environment to create a story or to invite an interaction or to invite participation in some way in the built environment and um, to work at the human scale to get groups of people to engage with each other socially, to learn, to play, um, to um, ultimately, uh, I guess, come out a, a little transformed by having gone through that space. That's the practice we do now, and we, and we do it by any means necessary. So we've learned how to use large-scale displays, for example, because that became an interesting tool for, doing, for creating experiences in the built environment. In and of themselves, they're not an experience or even necessarily that interesting, unless they're being used to do the, some of the things I was saying, to you know, kind of make you look, to get you to pay attention, to get you to pause, to get you excited, to make you calm, as, as a tool for evoking a kind of experience you're going for. So you could think that immersive design was in the built environment was about inc incredibly amazing pharaohs, tombs of digitally lined walls that just have media on them that sort of take you to another place than where you, you are. Or you could think of it as just a way to a way to draw you into a story in an environment and it doesn't have to be so complete i guess you know i think um that there's something big and iconic in an installation is important i think to get people to pay attention um, but it doesn't have to completely en envelop you in order to be immersive and i think that an, a, another way to think about what is an immersive experience is to perhaps make the requirement that you fully engage in it or you fully participate in that moment, in that place. And that's transformative. Almost maybe you lose sense of time because it's so great. You're, you've been immersed. <laughs> uh, you, you've been drawn into an experience that takes you to another place for a moment, and uh, but not necessarily by tricking you, but by transforming you, I suppose. And that can be done so many different ways. I remember, Charlie, when I was at the University of Chicago as a sophomore there, I built a maze uh, on a f soccer field. It was about 70 yards long. And it was a garden of forking paths. Essentially, it was a diamond-shaped maze, and there was diamonds at every intersection. And as you went through, you, you, came, you went through a front door, which was the first fork. And as you went through, there were two to the eight pathways, 256 pathways, through this maze. And, it, and then it funneled out the end. and. It was a, a choose your life story type of poetry maze experience that you walk through and everyone kind of funneled at the end. You can, you know, you're born and you die and everything in between are those other 256 options as you go through. And this was made with burlap and wood and these hand stenciled signs. And I remember like the best compliment I got from it was one of the graduate art students there said to me, it really took me to another place, but I went through it. And while I was in there, I was in another place. <laughs> And then when you came out the other side, you're like back in the real world, back in another world. And, and uh, it just strikes me that that's a, that's a great example of immersive design, an immersive experience. Uh, and so that has always driven my practice. Um, and I think maybe I'll shift gears for a bit and talk about when it all started. Would you like me to do that? Yes, very much so. I'm, yeah, I'd love to hear that. Well, I, I would say that I've been moving in this direction for my whole working career. I, I started it pretty early. I gave you just that reference back to that maze back from college days, project I love very dearly. And then I got into interactive media working for Alan Lomax in the early 90s. And I wouldn't call that an immersive experience at all. That was a research and power tool experience of having the computer sort through audiovisual material and a database to present to you amazing patterns of human performance style and 
that was how I cut my teeth in the world of computational media and had a wonderful four or five years in working in that shop. And then I happened into working at, at Schlossberg's practice, which was all about interactive environments. So I'd say as of that moment, the notion of immersive design, my immersive practice began because that's what was being practiced at ESI Design. Because all our projects always had an address. They were physical places, they were environmental projects. And we worked to do many of the things I'm saying, make up an immersive experience. We didn't call it that back then. Back then, What did we call it? I suppose we called it experience design, we called it exhibit design, uh, interactive design in the in interactive environments. And this was in the mid 90s. And my first big project, the heart and soul project that I did with ESI and Ed was the Chicago Symphony Orchestra Interactive Music Learning Center that opened in 1998. And uh, that was called Echo and was part of an expansion of Symphony Hall in Chicago. And as part of it, they had a program to create an interactive music learning center. And it was interesting as we worked on the design, we eventually came to the conclusion that we shouldn't do anything with any interactive media in the program, that we would be better served by creating uh, essentially a playground room full of instruments um, and a program of how to play with them. Um, and that would really serve the desires of the organization to get people engaged in making music, to invite the general public to the classical music world, to invite a younger audience to the classical music world, to invite a more diverse audience to that world. And interestingly, the, the client said, that's, that's great. We want an interactive media computer driven installation. Thank you very much. And so we uh, compromised and we split the space in half and the back half was an instrument playground with Carl Orff instruments and fun toys, maps and things that you could play with and primarily a program of engagement that we designed uh, uh, for activating groups of people. Uh, and the front half was this interactive program, which was pretty fun. And we created these controllers, had IDs on them that visitors and primarily the visitors were school groups could get as their tool or ticket their interface that they carried around with them to activate each of the exhibit posts. And so we had one that was modeled after a membrana phone, one after a cordophone, one after an idiophone, and one after an aerophone, after Kurt Sachs' instrument typology. I think that comes from him. And the thought was, you know, when you, what we created was when visitors came, they either got an aerophone digital controller tool with an ID or an idiophone and they went around and they would snap that interface onto the exhibit and the exhibit would come to life and uh, the way they could interact with the exhibit was through the instrument and they would learn how to play a little melody or they'd learn how to play in sync bowl. And uh, then they would, when they were done with that particular activity, they'd snap that off, go to the next exhibit and carry through. And, and of course we knew who you were because we'd asked your name. And so it had this personalized touch to it. I mean, I would classify that as an immersive design an immersive experience that we designed. It was lovely um, and it was beautiful. I mean, there was one, Charlie, I think you'd appreciate. It was all about interpretation of scores. And the, the premise was, well, why, why go to the classical, why go to Symphony Hall to see a show when you can hear it online, you know, you can, or buy a record. And we wanted to communicate that every time a music piece of music is performed it's actually different it's like a snowflake you know that just because there's a score and a performance of it every day is a slightly different interpretation so going to see Bach or Beethoven performed yet again had real value because you were going to hear that day's unique re performance and so we wanted to instill that thought in young folks uh, about going to see live music or going to see even classical music and so the way we wanted to teach this was indirectly or do something that was intuitive. And so we took a poem and actually I don't recall what poem we took, but we, ha it was, we had a recording of the poet reading the poem. And then we hired three other actors to read the poem. And of course they each read them at their own pace, but we designed it in such a way that the poem as it was being read, it would be 
high lit on the page in this kind of beautiful handwritten style and you just see and at any given moment you could just change the reader and he hear a different voice and it would just pick up in perfect sync and this was 1998 style interactive media but it was just beautiful it was something you couldn't really do in any other medium except an interactive software environment and it was so simple but it was so lovely to listen to this poem and then immediately switch gears to the next the next reader and it wouldn't wouldn't even miss a beat just it would go from the one word to the next and and then you'd hear all these different intonations and ways of interpreting that text then we put up a, a section from the goldberg variations and we had glenn gould and i think charles rosen and two other interpreters playing goldberg variations and did the same thing and as the score went by and they really played at different tempos you could switch between these uh, glenn gould did a very slow one i believe but it was they were remarkably different and you could just switch mesh just like you were doing line by line with the poem you could switch measure by measure with the score and the score would highlight and it would just brought home this idea very viscerally that every performance is unique in spite of the fact that the score remains the same that's direct learning <laughs> that's learning through direct experience without having to maybe put into words what we're trying to say. And that's the goal of experience design is to learn directly through your interaction or experience without having to verbalize necessarily what's being. So I love that as a model of things. To me, that's an immersive experience, I suppose, or that's just a good example of good experience design in this whole immersive environment. So that was in 1998. I think that probably around uh, that time or shortly after the term experience design came more into vogue and that's what I practice now That's the practice I have here in era is Experience design and what's remarkable to me is how much the world is asking for that And I'm always interested to see what they mean by that when they ask But more and more people do ask and create projects that they call experience design projects As the world has gotten more used to that. I'll fast forward. I think to another project many years later, now 2015, and we're working in an ultra green sky rise in Pittsburgh for PNC Bank. And the head of real estate is building an ambitious attempt to create the greenest tall building in the world. And when it came about in 2015, it, it, it certainly was, and it still is in the top 10, 32 story building, blows the top off of lead platinum requirements, uh, trying to set new standards, and really wonderful project. And ESI was brought in to do the communications and engagement design of the building. And that was a wonderful way to talk about the assignment because it was very open as to what would come from that. But the need was that this incredibly complex organism-like building was being designed by Gensler and Bureau Happold and with a very complex brain and limbs and systems for making decisions about how it was going to ingest and excrete and process. And all of that was entirely invisible to anyone who didn't know. It looked like any other building for the most part. And so the goal was, the assignment was, can you give this building a voice or can you help this building to talk? and explain itself and help people understand what's going on with this unique building, particularly the occupants of the building who are going to find that this building doesn't behave like a typical building, nor does it expect you to behave like you're in a typical building. So we went to work on that and got very interested in the data that the building was producing, which was voluminous. Uh, this is one of the modern buildings that is laden with sensors and has hundreds of thousands of sensors that are detecting what's happening outside and what's happening inside and making a number of decisions about what to do so that in this case, it can turn off fossil fuel expensive HVAC systems and allow for natural breezes or natural ventilations to do cooling and reduce the energy use of the building. The goal was upwards of 42% a year. So doing a real service by having this very intelligent building and there's so much data that needed to be brought down to a central brain uh, that then brain is called the building automation system, the BAS or the building management system, BMS. And we created a, an art piece that was both uh, also an information piece that 
connected to the brain, connected to the building automation system, and um, communicated it out to the public through this beautiful light and data sculpture, this iconic piece called the beacon that hung in the lobby and was a ever-present data visualization of the building's activity. I like to think of it as, you know, they say when you, the, the way to look into someone's soul is through their eyes. I like to think that the way to look into this building's soul was through this beacon. There was a way uh, to look into it and see what was going on. On the other end of the spectrum, I also sometimes thought of this thing as the most expensive and beautiful, you know, hood ornament on a very fancy car. Because in a way, it was that also. A gorgeous piece, like a trophy, triumphant piece. However, our goal was to create something that communicated and was beautiful. And uh, I think we did that. And we uh, tapped into the story of breathing. This wasn't our metaphor, but they always, the designers of the, of the building, you know, their concept was uh, that the building could breathe. And so we wanted to show when, and breathing meant that the double skin glass facade of the building could robotically open in specific bays and shut down HVAC air conditioning and allow this beautiful gentle breeze, even at the 31st floor to flow through that area. And almost like you're sitting on a screen porch in the country, they were able to create that kind of pressure effect in the building much of the year and not use so much air conditioning. And we wanted to show, if you looked at this beacon, how much of the building was breathing right now or how much water was being recycled by the building right now or how much energy is being used by floor right now. And you got this feeling of being in this more lifelike, not a machine, but an organism. And not so much like a machine, but like an organism. So that was what we accomplished. But there's a key part to this that I think makes this theoretically, I would say more theoretically than success, than actually uh, immersive. And we wanted there to be a way to interpret what you were seeing. <clears throat> we didn't, I didn't want to do something that was enigmatic and something that just simply evoked. I wanted to do something that also explained itself or was useful or helped you learn. And so there was another feature to this where we wanted to cr create it, these tablets. We wanted them posted around in the environment. Ultimately, we didn't do that. But at the security desk, you could get a tablet. And on the tablet, we designed and built this very complex website that reflected in real time, mirrored what you were seeing on this beautiful beacon, which was a technical accomplishment that was very difficult to do. But it did work. And when, this, when you saw the beacon shimmering and evoking and making you wonder what it was with maybe just one big word on it, this tablet, you could hold it up and then it would say, do you, want, do you see what you, do you want to know what you're seeing? Right now, it's telling you that the building's breathing. What does that mean, it's breathing? Oh, it means that the building's doing natural ventilation. What's natural ventilation? And then you could go down into a more traditional branching set of moments that explained how the building had been designed and engineered to breathe. And the client said, you know, when it came to value engineering time, they're like, we don't really need that tablet explanatory interpretive piece. We're fine with just this beautiful sculpture. But we really leaned hard and ultimately convinced the client was a critical part of the story uh, because we felt that to unpack it and be able to learn what you're seeing through participation would bring people into it and connect them to it more. And in that way, I, 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 that, that's what I said earlier about, I think one of the definitions of what makes an immersive experience is something that requires your participation or invites you to participate and close the loop because then you feel like you're in it or with it. I feel if you're just like strolling through that lobby every day and you sort of look up and you that thing you say, hey, that's cool. It's not the same as if you stood underneath it, you stood with it, maybe you held this tool and you just for a moment connected with it and learned what it was telling you. And that makes that experience more immersive, more holistic than one that is just so sort of cool to look at. So maybe that's the way to get an immersive experience is by getting people into it. It's not necessarily by covering every square inch of surface around them with media that can simulate another environment. I don't think that's the way. You could do that and still not have it be immersive, I suppose, by that definition. And you could have something that has very little in the way of dynamic stimulation around you and have something immersive like that maze I told you about, I suppose. That it was something that you did and you went through and you were completely in for a period of time and you weren't doing anything else you weren't checking your phone 
you know, there weren't any phones in those days, but, you know, people I, I see now are like hungry for things that can't be interrupted, like sailing, for example. They just love to, you know, when I'm out sailing for that 45 minutes, I don't have time to in, be interrupted by the latest headline from Kiev. That kind of immersion is like doing something that playing a piece of music, as you know, Charlie, from the moment you start that piece of music to when you're done, that's all you're doing. And that's lovely. And it has this kind of through line, this thread through it. I think that the work that we're doing now in experience design is continuing to try to create more interesting in-person group experiences and in-person group interfaces that get people to engage in public spaces in different ways. So there's so much work that's being done um, at the phone level, at the laptop level, at the touchscreen level, and that's being pretty well defined as to what the model of interaction, yeah, you know, there's so much happening there, but that's a, a more firm terra firma for design. But the group of people in a stadium or the group of people in a plaza interacting or with, or just being aware of the dynamism of that public plaza, the data that's flowing through it, how you may message within it or not with a group of people is a very mushy and undesigned and undefined area yet where I think this work is going. Um, and, uh, you know, when people come and ask for experience design now, I think they are more interested in the big flashy media displays and the integration of media into architecture in these really interesting ways, and that's fine. But it's the behaviors that it, it will surprise people when those are designed into them, that they're new possibilities that they never even imagined. I could go on, Charlie, but I think I've covered a variety of things. I think you have. I think you've really uh, given enough material for what I'm doing. But it's been fascinating talking to you, and uh, I, I'm just delighted to have had this conversation. Um, I will share with you that serendipitously, um, what you said about the, the beacon is exactly parallel to what we're designing in uh, in CNP PVP as a device for a person in an audio environment between tracking their own behaviors and the environment itself and it would be in individual and group cases also a tool for the system to make decisions so uh, it's quite, quite fascinating to hear you describe that that's great that's so cool I'm so glad we did this Charlie it was great to help me focus on some of these stories and really a pleasure well, pleasure working with you on, on, on this. It's been really a unique discussion. So uh, cool. and wonderful to fo follow, the, see the big picture of your life. Uh, Thank thanks you. so much. I'll be in New York. Cool. Cool. What you doing? Let's see. Uh, we have a skyscraper that's interested in, in, in sound. So they're having, we're having a, a meeting about it. And, uh, so, cool. So doing a, doing a presentation. Nice. I got a, a great call from J.P. Morgan Chase this week. You know, I don't know if you know this, but J.P. Morgan Chase is, uh, it, I mean, it, to me, this is just beyond the beyond of opulence and waste, frankly. But, you know, um, J.P. Morgan Chase, their headquarters is uh, 270 Park Avenue, you know, and it's this colossal building. And they're going to raise the building. Um, and it's apparently it's the biggest raising of a built a vertical structure in situ ever they're going to take the entire building down and they're designing a new building and they're going to put it there <laughs> a new headquarters yeah like i mean you know who made that decision how did that get made it's right out of the magic christian you remember i vaguely do i remember that book well the story is he i remember seeing around the house i suppose <laughs> yeah. but there was a um, beautiful building in downtown chicago that everyone loves and he buys the place and he tears it down and puts up a parking lot just to anger people classic right yeah well so they're going to build this you know multi-billion dollar headquarters for themselves because the one they have there is not good enough you know like okay and and the lobby is going to be this like hall the size of grand central station you know it's just like that's the lobby it's just going to be this like new grand central station uh, thing so then i got called to go in and pitch that on thursday so wish me luck. Well, um, I, you'd be perfect for it. I think you have. It's so cool, though. Feeling. The cool thing was they uh, they called Air Up because they, they thought of us as an experienced design studio. That how is the hell, I, How the hell that happened, I don't know, but I'm so happy. So That is great. Well, it's absolutely wonderful to hear about that. I hope you win. Thank you.
All right, Charlie. Well, it's great to, great to talk to you. This was really fun. Be well. All right. Take care, Charlie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. This is Immerse, the podcast and book. We are delighted to have you join us. Immerse is produced by Charlie Morrow, Sean McCann, and Bart Plantenga for Morrow Sound, Vermont, and Helsinki, and Recital Edition, Los Angeles. Immerse. 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 Immerse.